looking at, secondly, the preaching of Peter. The preaching of Peter. And I again thank you for letting me take some time to go through this sermon. It has helped me tremendously and in a homiletical way and to be reminded of what's important in preaching. So we're still looking at the second part of Acts 2 for us, the preaching of Peter. And we want to look today at verses 37 through 41. Acts chapter 2, and let's, I tell you, let's begin with verse 36 where we left off last week and look through 41. Acts 2, verse 36, Peter is speaking, preaching, and he says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves, he said, from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. We have followed the work of the church here in Acts as it began and as it got started. God chose a very dramatic way to give birth to what we now know as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 2. Jesus has risen from the dead. We looked at his resurrection. He ascended in Acts 1 back to the Father. We looked at his ascension and his exaltation. And in that process, he had spent 40 days with the disciples and then left them, ascended back to heaven, and they were instructed to go to Jerusalem and wait on the coming of the Holy Spirit for 10 days, which they did. And they waited in the upper room, about 120 of them, the Bible says, and just waited. They waited on the predetermined, pre-planned day that God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit had planned in the four councils of the divine Godhead before the world was ever created. And as you read here through Peter's sermon, that God had chosen that day, the day of Pentecost, for the Holy Spirit to come. And it was nothing they did. There was no begging and pleading for the Holy Spirit. There was no jumping through hoops. This was when God planned that the Holy Spirit would baptize his people and fill them. And then in verse 14 of chapter 2, we saw, and I want to emphasize it again, Peter stood up with the 11 other apostles around him. He addressed the crowd, and he said, Fellow Jews, in verse 14, and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. And that's what preaching is. That's what preaching is, to have something explained. And he goes on in verse 14 and says, listen carefully to what I say. So it's up to the preacher to study and explain. It's up to the people to listen. And then he began his sermon again in verse 22. He said, listen to this. Listen to me. And so here right after the the, the giving of the Holy Spirit, the first thing that happened was a Christian sermon was preached. A song wasn't sung, an offering wasn't taken, a sermon was preached after the Holy Spirit came. And Peter, in this message, and we've looked at this verse by verse, he explained the Old Testament prophecy of Joel regarding the coming of the Spirit that day. He explained the prophecy of David regarding the death of Christ and the promise of resurrection. He explained another Old Testament text or prophecy of David in the Old Testament regarding the exaltation of Christ. So Peter bases his sermon in the biblical text. He 
places his sermon in the biblical text. We need to remember that. If you show up at a worship service and the guy gets in a pulpit and never opens a Bible, it's not a biblical sermon. Or if he preaches his opinions and his ideas and what God told him, then it'll be very leery of that. Even Peter, uneducated Peter, based his message in the biblical text, explaining what the Old Testament meant concerning the coming, the exaltation, the death, the resurrection of Christ. And what Peter does in this message is simply presents the gospel. He covers the gospel. Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation, all substantiated by the writings of Scripture and the events of Jesus' life and ministry and death and resurrection itself that they had all been witness to. They had seen it. So he uses Scripture to prove his points about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Now, granted, he was preaching to a crowd that knew the Old Testament. He was preaching to Jews who were in town because of Pentecost. He was preaching from Jews, and we talked about this, to they were some, some were from, from in Jerusalem from as far away as what the old used to be the old Babylon, far east is that, far west is Rome, far south is Egypt, and these Jews had come together to celebrate the week of Pentecost on this day of Pentecost. So he's preaching to religious people already. So when he mentions King David, they know who it is. When he mentions the prophet Joel, They know who that is. They understand that. They're familiar with those Old Testament texts. And in that, Peter had a little bit easier job than guys like I I have today. (laughs) Because we've even kind of raised up a generation of churchgoers that don't know much about the Bible. No offense, but come on, let's face it. We've raised up a generation of churchgoers that that are quick to tell you, well, I don't like to read. I don't read the Bible because I don't like to read. Study study the Bible? Why, the word study just sends shivers down our spine. So we pastors who stand up here, it's not that just we're preaching to, to pagans out there that don't know the Bible and weren't raised in church, we often find ourselves with large congregations who grew up in church and still don't know the Scriptures. I'm not saying that condemn it. I'm just saying that so you'll pray for your pastor. It's a hard job. Sometimes you wonder why I get so detailed in things and why I give so much detail. Because if you don't understand the details, you won't understand what's going on in the text. You don't understand what's happening here. That's why I try to give a lot of details. This book was never given to be read like this. Oh, I need a spiritual pick-me-up today. I need a little quick word from Jesus that's going to make me feel better. Let me see if I can find me a little verse today that's going to make me feel better. That's not the point and purpose of Scripture. As Paul told Timothy, the point and purpose of Scripture, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman in Scripture that doesn't have to be ashamed of their knowledge of the Scriptures. So Peter, as tough as he had it in the first century, And as courageous as this message is, in one way he had it a lot easier than guys like me have it these days. He was preaching to a crowd that already knew the Old Testament. He didn't have to explain a lot. He just had to connect the dots. And he did with lucidity and with logic and with reason and in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's preaching to these Jews who believed in the authority of Scripture. When when Peter said, the prophet Joel said, well, they believed him. 
They believed the word of God. They didn't, not one of them said, well, you know, I, I really don't believe that that's what Joel really said. And I don't believe God really inspired. They didn't argue with him about scripture. When he said, this is what David said, they didn't argue with him about that. They accepted the authority of the Old Testament. Years ago, a great evangelist named Billy Graham used to stand up in stadiums packed with hearers, and he would preach. And if you ever saw Mr. Graham preach, you remember this. He would stand there with a the Bible in his hand, and he would say, he, he would go like this. He would say, the Bible says, and the Bible says, and the Bible says, the Bible says. Because back then, even pagans recognized the authority of Scripture. Whether or not they agreed with it, he based his messages on the authority of the Word of God. This is God's Word. You stand up now, even in Christian churches, and hold up a Bible and say, this is what thus saith the Lord. The great majority of the congregation will say, well, that's your interpretation. Well, I don't really believe Paul actually said that. <laughs> I don't believe, these are things I've heard from church folk. Well, yeah, but you know, Paul and Jesus didn't agree with each other. I've heard this one recently. Jesus came along to show us a, a better side of God. You know, God was all wrath and fury in the Old Testament. Jesus came to show us a nicer side of God. There's some words I'd like to use about that, but I respect the pulpit, and I'll just refrain from doing it. What? The God of the Old Testament? is the same God as Jesus. <laughs> same God. This is the stuff you wrestle with with church people who no longer believe this is the authoritative word of God. They hear it preached Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and it never changes their lives. No change. At least Peter had a warm crowd. He had people that knew the Old Testament. All he had to do was to, all he had to do was tether Jesus to those Old Testament prophecies, and the people went, "He's right." We're going to see that. They believed in the authority of Scripture. And again, when you stand to say, and when you stand today and say, this is God's word, you even have people in Christian church pews that will argue with you about this being the word of God. I've had Christian church members, well, I'm not going to call them Christians, I'll just say I've had church members uh, when I preach on something. I've literally had several people over the course of my ministry say to me, well, I know what the Bible says about that, but I'm not going to do it. In the 80s, when the Southern, I was a Southern Baptist back then, and we were having these big wars in the Southern Baptist Convention about liberalism and conservatism, whether the Bible really was the Word of God. And we were going to conventions and hashing and battling out whether the Bible was really the Word of God and all this stuff. And, and I remember hearing the old, we, I went to a Georgia Baptist Convention meeting, and uh, the old great old black preacher, E.V. Hill, pastored the greater missionary church in Los Angeles, California. Y'all to YouTube E.V. Hill and just listen to him preach. Great old black preacher. He preached for us. And he was talking about those who don't believe Scripture in our churches and in our pulpits. He was talking about those who had doubts about the Word of God. I love, and I'll have to explain 
what I'm about to say to most of you, because most of you won't know what this is that I'm about to say. But I'll never forget old E.V. Hill. He said, now there's a play, and he, he was black, so give me a little liberty here. He said, let me tell you, he said, there's a place in our churches for those that have doubts. There's a place in our churches for those that aren't quite sure. But it's the mourner's bench and not the pulpit. Amen? Now let me explain what a mourner's bench is for those in the back. Years ago, it was called an altar. And when a preacher would preach and conviction fell on a sinner, they would go to the mourner's bench and cry over their sin. And E.V. Hill was saying, hey, it's okay if you got doubts. It's okay if you're not sure about everything. It's a place in church for you for that. But it ain't in the pulpit. It's not in leading a small group. It's not in leadership in the church. You need to go to the altar. The mourner's bench and get assured about the Word of God. It's just not that way today. There is this major movement in our society by the woke and by the progressives that only want to focus on certain passages and certain words, sentences that Jesus said to the exclusion of everything else in the Bible. Some of them are called red-letter Christians, if you've ever seen that phrase anywhere. I'm a red-letter Christian. What in the daylights is that about? Well, I just follow what Jesus said. What Jesus said is the Word of God as well as the rest of Scripture. The whole Bible is the Word of God. And Paul and Jesus agree, and Paul and Peter agree, and James and John agree, and the Old Testament agrees with the New Testament. And so we observe here the conclusion of Peter's lucid, logical, learned sermon. Here's the conclusion of it. And there's three things as quickly as possible I want to share with you about it. Number one, in verse 37, the response of the people. He got through preaching, and with emphatic words in verse 36, he says, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. I, I think there's a lot of church folk that aren't convinced of that yet. There's church folk who still say, oh, you know, I follow Jesus. I'm a Christian. But I think there's many ways to get to heaven. As long as you're sincere, you can, you can believe what you want. As long as you're sincere, sincerity is the acid test. doesn't matter what you believe. I've heard church people say that. Peter emphatically said, God made this Jesus, the one you crucified, he is Lord. And he is the Messiah. And maybe... The reason we have such problems in our churches and so many empty chairs is because there's a lot of people with their name on church rolls that still aren't yet convinced that Jesus is the only way. They're lost. They're lost. Notice the response of the people in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Three things here. Number one, they heard. Verse 37, when the people heard this. The word heard here is the Greek word from which we get our word acoustic from. Had a, had a heavier meaning in Greek. It means to hear, to pay attention, to understand, and to obey. Acoustikos, to obey. They not just heard. They didn't just hear a sermon. They heard it in such a way it sparked obedience in them. When was the last time you heard a sermon that sparked obedience 
in you. They were listening. God bless them. When they heard. I wonder sometimes, keeps me awake at night often, if we were to come to some of you on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday and ask the question, what did your pastor preach on last Sunday? I wonder how many of you could recall. <laughs> what did your pastor preach on last Sunday? What was his text last Sunday? What did he say last Sunday? Because we don't listen. We don't hear. Could you answer that question Wednesday or Thursday of this week? Secondly, it says in verse 17, in verse 37, they were cut to the heart. Wow, what a phrase. That's a long Greek word, and it literally means to be pierced, to be stabbed. It's a very graphic, violent word. It's a violent word in Greek. It means to be stabbed, to be pierced. Their hearts were stabbed by what Peter preached. begs the question what are we cut to the heart today about I got a feeling I have a feeling that when they heard Peter's message that day and they were cut to the heart they were pierced to the heart I got a feeling after it was over, they didn't walk out in the, the foyer and talk about ball games or vacations or politics. <laughs> it was a message that cut them to the heart. cuts us to the heart these days? Well, first, let's begin in the pulpit. We aren't cut to the heart through preaching because of so much powerless preaching. I'll put it on the fault of, the, of us pastors. Pastors that don't study. Pastors that download sermons off the internet. Pastors that, that preach about how to have wonderful lives and successful children. All that other foolishness and, and pragmatic idiocy. It's not biblical at all. I start in the pulpit. We're not cut to the heart by preaching anymore because so much preaching is powerless. It's not textually driven. It's not exegetical. It's not the Word of God. It's not what thus saith the Lord. So it starts here, but it doesn't end at the pulpit. Some preaching is biblical. It is exegetical. It is what thus saith the Lord. But because of carnal consciences, in the pew. It has a hard time getting to the souls of church members. Just carnal Christianity. Defiant demeanors. I ain't going to do what no, nobody going to tell me what to do, bless God. That preacher ain't going to tell me nothing. I'll tell you what, man. you moron. If a man in the pulpit is preaching what thus saith the Lord, it would do you well, sir, to listen to it. Nobody going to tell me. I'm defiant. I'm my own man. I'm a self-made man. Then why, dear sir, did you make yourself the way you are? Because you're a mess. We have such defiant demeanors. I've been amazed. I've been, folks, I've been doing this a long time. And it's gotten worse in the last few years. It's gotten worse. Christians are so defiant about things now. We got all these little Google theologians. All these little Google theologians 
think they know all about the Bible, think they got it all figured, they're so spiritual. And instead of coming to receive God's Word and listen, they're more interested in letting you know how much they know, how spiritual they are, and how on top of Scripture they are. Thank God, here were some people steeped in the Old Testament who had the good sense to acoustinos, listen, listen. Remember Peter said, y'all be quiet and listen to me a minute. Remember that verse? Y'all let me explain this to you. One more time, powerless preaching begins here. Carnal consciences defiant demeanors. So they heard, they were cut to the heart by his sermon, and then they asked, what can we do? What can I do? What can I do? Again, as opposed to telling Peter what they thought or what they would or wouldn't do, they faced the reality of what he said. They faced his message. His message was, God sent his son, the Messiah. You killed him on a cross. You are guilty of the death of the Messiah. It was your sin, your action that put him there. But God raised him from the dead. God caused him to ascend to the heaven. God has highly exalted him and set him at his right hand. This one that you killed, he is the Messiah. And it cut them to the heart. Why doesn't preaching about Jesus cut us to the heart anymore? Why, why doesn't when the beauty and majesty of Christ is preached and when the gospel is preached, why doesn't it stab us in the heart anymore? Brothers, what shall we do? Peter understood as he preached to them, they understood that they stood guilty before a holy God of the worst sin ever, crucifying Jesus. And it cut them to the heart in conviction. They knew that the guilt led to divine wrath. See, they knew the Old Testament. They knew that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. They knew that because that's what the Old Testament says. They knew that if you sinned against God, it brought death. Sodom and Gomorrah. Noah and the ark. You disobey God. God brings death. They knew all that. They, they would never have argued with the doctrine of the wrath of God. They were convinced of the wrath of God. Peter says, you are sinners. You put God's Son on a cross because of your sin. What, what can I do? They had a profound fear of God's judgment and wrath and vengeance. Peter's sermon here is based on Scripture. It was accomplished with lucid arguments and reason, and it ends in a response. Brothers, what shall we do? We are in a mess. They heard. They were cut to the heart. They asked, what can we do? Preaching ought to bring every listener to that point. <laughs> what can I do? What can I do? Jonathan Edwards was a great evangelist of the 1700s. I was so encouraged to hear a few weeks ago that one of our dear members is reading some of the works of Jonathan Edwards. And his, what he, the stuff he wrote is really hard. He was a great theologian, great preacher. But he's, it, it's old English writing, and it's kind of hard, and you have to read it three or four times. I, one of our church members said, yeah, I'm, I'm reading Jonathan Edwards, and I about went Pentecostal. Amen. Hallelujah. Read guys like that. Jonathan Edwards had a sermon he preached called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, I know that's not progressive and woke, but it's biblical. And Jonathan Edwards was a frail little man. And he preached that sermon one night in a church for the first time. 
small little country church, 1700s, where they didn't have lights, electricity. They had candles, lamps burning. And he stood behind the pulpit, and he read verbatim the manuscript. It was written out longhand, and he simply stood there and read this sermon holding a candle. No big displays of emotion, no jumping up and down on the stage, no lights, no fog machines, no rock bands, no circuses, nothing. Jonathan Edwards stood and by candlelight read word for word his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He wore a robe, and by the end of the message, the pastor of the church was pulling on Edward's robe saying, Edwards, is there any hope for me? Now you think, well, that's a little extreme. Folk, our nation and our churches are in an extreme mess. We need some extreme preaching that drives people to their knees about the wrath of God and places the fear of God in them so they repent and come to Christ. And that's starting with church members. Edwards, is there any hope for me? They responded, they heard, they were cut to the heart. And they asked, what can we do? Secondly, notice the reply of Peter. Now this is, boy, this is the crux of the matter here. Verse 38. Now Peter understands they cannot change what's been done. Christ has been crucified. They are sinners in the hands of an angry God. You can, they can't change that. They can't go to church enough to change that. They can't give enough money to church to change that. They can't, they can't be good enough to change that. That's their predicament. So Peter replies. And as I read these couple of things here, let me encourage you, don't get hung up on the order of what Peter says here. Because this order later in Acts can be reversed in different ways. And so many people try to nail what down too tightly what he says here. Don't concern so much about the order of what he's saying. Listen to what he said. Peter replied. You know what they were saying? They were saying, what must we do to be right with God? They, they were saying the same thing that the Philippian jailer would say to Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16 when he fell on his knees in front of them and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's the same question. What, what should we do? You know, I don't know if you know this. I don't have a lot of people running to me these days saying, Sir... What must I do to be saved? Now, maybe may my powerless preaching, maybe. Maybe carnal consciences. Maybe depraved demeanors. I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've told this story. I've been here a long time, so you've heard all my stories, and I'm going to tell this one again. Years and years ago, I was part of a pastor's group, just a bunch of random pastors that met every Wednesday morning at the Cracker Barrel in McDonough, because that's where spiritual pastors eat breakfast. And there was eight or ten of us, and we'd meet every Wednesday morning. And, you know, that was way back when, 03, 04, 05, when, this, when church was really changing, and the big emphasis then 
was, you know, people just live with all the psychologists. Where people have so much guilt. People have so much shame. And if you can alleviate people's guilt, man, oh, that's the thing. you got to alleviate people's shame. And people are so guilty and shameful. And, and our church has got to be a place where the guilty can, can find peace and, and be relieved of their shame. And You know what old, uh, old preachers used to call that conviction. Used to be called conviction of the Holy Spirit. We gotta get rid of our guilt. We gotta get rid of our shame. We gotta feel better about ourselves. And so, all these guys I'm meeting with, y'all know I don't like preachers anyway. I don't. I, I've got one preacher friend, and we're not close. And all these guys were talking about, man, we just need to turn our churches into these places where we alleviate people's shame. Not, and I know the gospel does that. I, I get it. But I sat and listened to this conversation for a couple of hours while eating my French toast and bacon. And finally I said, guys, let me ask you a question. I said, I said, y'all got long lines of people down the front the street in front of your church every Sunday looking to be forgiven, be alleviated from their guilt and shame? Y'all really got people waiting in line for that? I said, because I don't. I ain't got nobody banging on my door saying, I've sinned before a holy God. Preacher, tell me how to be forgiven. I said, I ain't got that problem. Y'all got that problem? Are y'all tracking with me? Tell you what, I'll quit in a minute and make this a two-parter if you'll say amen right now. Okay. Okay. I said, really, y'all got lines of people that are so broken and convicted and, and, and downtrodden and on their knees because of their, their sin against the holy God and their guilt and their shame before sinning against God that they're beating your door down to find relief? Really? They kicked me out of the group. Whatever happened? It's Isaiah, who was a God-fearing man, went to the temple one day and the holiness of God fell on him. And, 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 and he saw the holiness of God and he dropped to his knees. And even Isaiah said, oh, I'm a sinner before a holy God. What happened to that? Peter said, Repent. Greek word is metanoia. It comes in different forms, but that's the root word. Repentance in the New Testament means to change your attitude and thoughts. And when thoughts and attitudes are changed, that will lead to behavioral changes. That's a general word. It's, a, it's a, not necessarily a spiritual word. It's a general type word that is used in Scripture to talk about changing one's mind. So Peter said, okay guys, you who have crucified Jesus, you who have sinned, you who now understand Jesus is the one Joel talked about. He's the one David prophesied about. You've, you've made the connection now. You realize God is holy. You are not. You've asked the right question. You've asked the right question. What can I do? That's the right question. And he said, repent. Change your frame of mind, your feeling about something. Change your mind. Change your mind about who Jesus is and what God accomplished through him. Change your mind about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost today. Change your mind that you are not the good, wonderful, religious people you think you are because remember, they were all religious Jews. He wasn't preaching to pagans here. He wasn't preaching to law, to uh, godless Romans. He, he was preaching 
to the 12 tribes of Israel, to Jews who had come to town, who had left their homes, spent their money to come and do what God said in the Old Testament, celebrate Pentecost. They were religious people. And Peter said to religious people, repent, change your mind. He simply said what John the Baptist said. Remember what John the Baptist said? He came out of the wilderness preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark 3, 2. Peter repeated what Jesus said several times. You can look at it in Matthew 4, 17. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent. Repent. Now we know from later writings in the New Testament because Paul agreed with Jesus and Peter agreed with Paul and Luke, the writer of Acts, agreed with all of them. We know later that repentance is impossible in and of ourselves. Romans chapter 3. There's none that doeth good. Repentance is a good thing. And the Bible says you can't do any good. We know from the writings of Paul, if I'm going to repent, I am not capable in and of myself. It must be done by God through me. Repentance is a work of God. It is not a work of you. Because all the scriptures agree about that. <laughs> he said, well, repent. And be baptized. Again, don't get too twisted down in this. We know from the rest of the scripture that baptism is not required for salvation. Hermeneutics 101. Scripture explains Scripture. <laughs> so we know from other parts of the Bible, Peter is not saying that you must be baptized to be saved. No, he says repent because people who repent and turn toward God, they follow the first command of Jesus, not to be saved, not to acquire salvation, but because God has already saved them and the first command of Jesus is to be baptized. Now, if, you're, if you claim to be a Christian today and have never been baptized, you are living in willful disobedience to the first command of Christ. The first thing he asks you to do, be baptized. It's disobedience not to be. So Peter, having heard three years of Jesus' teaching, says, you have to change your mind. And we know from the rest of the New Testament that has to be a work wrought by the Holy Spirit in our spirits and in our minds, to repent and be baptized. And this is a very singular nature thing. It's very individual. You as a person. Baptism is a sign that you belong to the community of Christ. It's a church thing. You are baptized into the church. It's just not something between you and Jesus solely. It's between you and Jesus and his church. It's a church thing. But you do it because he has already regenerated you. They were a little familiar with the baptism of John the Baptist. And during the, the years between the Old Testament and New Testament, we call them the 400 silent years. This thing about baptism, and you see Jew, John the Baptist coming out of the wilderness, baptizing people, baptizing uh, Jesus, but it wasn't Christian baptism as we know it. Peter is using what he has seen. Again, it's developed later in the New Testament. But it, was an, it could be an initiation into Judaism. Judaism. 
it signified radical repentance and reconsecration of one's life under Judaism. When John the Baptist baptized, it was people who just wanted to turn back to God, recommit, reconsecrate their lives. It was under Jewish life, Old Testament life. Paul, in the New Testament, took baptism, revamped it for us under Christian understanding, in a Christian understanding. It represents the life, death, and burial and resurrection of Christ in a church community. John the Baptist said, Matthew 3.11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worried to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John in Christ, John the Baptist and Jesus preach the same repentance, the same baptism. Peter is taking what he knows about that at the moment and applying it in this situation. And the, the emphasis here is simply a matter of obedience here. <laughs> Are you going to obey it? So repent. Repentance is required. The good news is, it is the Holy Spirit that gives you the spirit of repentance. That's the good news. Repent. Follow Christ in baptism as he commanded. And let me just throw this in. The Greek word, baptizo. I probably should quit right there. My alarm's going off. So I'm probably about to insult a couple of you. The Greek word itself, baptizo, means to be fully immersed underwater. That's what the word means. How people got sprinkling out of that, I will never know. The word itself means to be plunged beneath the surface of the water. But somehow, through Catholicism, it came up with sprinkling because we're afraid of water now. Uh, you can explain that to me. So he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Now, from here, I'm going to stop right there. But Lord willing, next Sunday, we're going to take that phrase, every one of you, and talk about God's general call to salvation. And then we're going to go down to the latter part where he says, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And we're going to talk about effectual calling because the two aren't the same. And then we're going to note the repentance of those who got converted that day, that somehow led to 3,000 people being converted, repenting, being baptized, and following Jesus. Religious people. They weren't pagans. We would say they were church folk. They were in town on religious reasons. That's why they were there. They believed God of the Old Testament. They believed David. They believed Joel. They They believed in the authority of the Old Testament more than most of you do. Peter didn't have to preach to convince them that this is the Word of God. He didn't have to do that. They knew it was. And 3,000 church-going religious people in town to celebrate a religious festival got saved. Always a good thing when church folk get saved, amen? I'm going to tell you something, folk, and I say this not arrogantly, not sarcastically. I say this from a broken heart. I believe there's a lot of church folk. I, I've been in this 30 years now. I'm about to be 60 years old. I've seen a lot. And I believe in the days in which we are living, there's a lot of church folk that just don't know Jesus. They just don't know Jesus. They're religious. They sing the Jesus songs. 
You know, in, fact, in fact, some of those songs make the hair on the back of their neck stand up. Woo! Oh, they're good folks. They take good care of their pets, and, and they, don't, they, don't, they treat their kids good. They love their grandbabies, and they pay their taxes, and they work. They're good folks, but they're lost, and they don't know Jesus. That's why you have to beg them to come to church. That's why you have to beg them to read the Bible. So I have to beg them to give. So I have to beg them to serve. That's why the chairs are empty. Lost. Religious, but lost. And like the pastor, when John Edwards preached his sermon that night, there's a lot of church folk ought to be on their knees tugging at the leg of a pastor saying, is there any hope for me? Well, boy, I didn't come to hear that this morning. Well, maybe that's exactly what you need to hear. And maybe you need to go home and obey the Word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 where the Apostle Paul says, examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. Well, I've been in church all my life. Examine yourself. Are you really in the faith? Well, I'm a good person. Examine yourself. Are you really in the faith? That was the preaching of Peter. I think we need more Peter sermons these days. <laughs> Who Jesus is. And what is your response to him? Let's pray.